Tarshni and I'm a case counsel with the AIAC. Today, I am pleased to introduce my co-interviewer, Rocio. Rocio is a legal consultant for White and Case and a research associate at Leicester Law School. Based in Rome, she has experience as a counsel in commercial and investment treaty arbitration under the rules of leading arbitral institutions, including ICSID, ICC, and ICDR. Rocio has also acted as a sole arbitrator under the rules of the CAM. Rocio's research at Leicester Law School is part of a project investigating the social and psychological underpinnings of commercial arbitration in Europe. Together, Rocio and I will be interviewing Segi Mando. Segi Mando acts primarily as an arbitrator. He is a lawyer incorporated in Madrid and his focus lies in the fields of construction and engineering, related in particular to en energy, infrastructure, buildings, and the naval sector. Segimando is also experienced in media and entertainment, and he has been the Secretary General of the CEA, that is the Spanish Arbitration Club, from 2017 to 2020. He is now a member of the Board of Directors of the CEA. Segimando is registered and has performed as an arbitrator under the rules of many of the major leading arbitral institutions. So my first question for you today is, what inspired you to pursue a career in arbitration and how would you describe your journey to date? Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. And uh, I'll try to give you all the inside information that I have on, on this. Well, it was totally unexpected. I was a very tough litigator and all of a sudden I made contact with arbitration and um, decided to take a course in the very well recognized uh, IE business school when, uh, where I met very interesting people and most of the prominent arbitrators in Spain who were teaching in, in that course. And after that, I decided to join the Swiss Arbitration Academy for a full international arbitration course and that was my peak. I, I, I was totally involved in, in arbitration then. During this first course in the, in the IE business school, uh, and again, totally unexpected, I got in touch with the Mood Madrid, the competition for students, and also with the CIA, the Spanish Arbitration and Club. And uh, that, that was my crush with uh, arbitration. And um, I got very much involved in, in both the Mood Madrid and the Spanish Arbitration Club. And in 2014, I was selected co-chair of the CEA Under 40 uh, group for the period 2015, 2016. And after that, I was appointed Secretary General for the uh, Spanish Arbitration Club, the CIA, CA, for the period between 2017 and 2020. And that's mostly my, my institutional uh, part of the, of the career. In terms of uh, practice, um, I got my first uh, appointment uh, in arbitration in 2014. That was a domestic arbitration. I was uh, very pleased to have that. And my first international appointment was in uh, 2018. It was uh, not very long in, in this, uh, I mean, as an arbitrator, that was 2018. And it's, um, when, when you know about arbitration, you feel that you are touching everything that you have learned in, in law, because you can act as counsel. So if you're a litigator, you can still uh, practice your, your skills and, and do your practice in, in arbitration as counsel. And if you decide to pursue the career as an arbitrator, you are having a different position, very difficult one, because you have to decide the matters that the parties are presenting before you. So it's a challenge without a doubt, but it's a challenge that if you take it with a good heart, you can do a very good job on, on it. Uh, if you had to pick one skill that is most important to have as an arbitrator, what would you say it is? And just listening to you describe sort of your litigation background, I'm wondering if there are particular sort of litigation skills 
uh, or skill set that you have applied to arbitration that you think is important? Uh, and, and how can younger practitioners cultivate this? Well, uh, I would say if you want to act as an arbitrator, you need to have iron fist in a velvet glove because you have to be hard, but you have to be soft. You have to, you need to have the ability to conduct the proceeding, but not pleasing the parties, but integrating the needs of the party in the proceeding, respecting the rules. So they need to see that you have everything under control, although sometimes you know you don't have everything under control, but you need to negotiate constantly with the parties, knowing that you are in charge of the proceeding, that although you are in charge of the proceeding, the proceeding belong to the parties. The other skill is academy. You need to have a very strong background, uh, academic background in arbitration. You need to study a lot. If you're working with the rules of an institution, you need to know very deep the content of the rules, uh, all the way out, all the circumventions that they can take with the rules. So you need to be very well prepared for every step in the arbitration proceeding in order to be able to you know, step forward and um, be a step forward from the parties and be prepared for what the parties are going, are going to demand uh, from you. So that preparation is essential for the, the arbitrator in a, in a proceeding. And of course, the other one is practice. And you can gain practice both working in an arbitration case, but also um, participating in uh, conferences all over the world. And I say all over the world because actually it's very easy to be connected, to, to attend a conference in almost any part of the world because with the new technologies and with all these Zoom um, teams and everything that we now use almost every day, it's very easy to be anywhere in the world, attending conferences and gaining experience from all the people working in, in arbitration. It's um, because arbitration is not as transparent as it, as it should be, and that is changing primarily because of the ICC. They're pushing very hard for that, but all the institutions are doing the same. But because of that, we cannot read as much as with um, um, normal judgments in local courts. So we need to go to these conferences to hear from the professionals what's going on on arbitration. We need to read the articles that they publish in the journals in order to be up to date with the last development in international arbitration. And we need to think about them and think the way we can apply them in our day-to-day -day practice. So these are probably the three points that I will highlight um, about the, the skills that one has to do. But it's also very important to have oral skills and you need to develop those oral skills in many ways, discussing with colleagues, having professional conversations, joining, um, conferences, trying to uh, open the panel to the, to the floor in order to be able to raise a question and follow up the answer and make this discussion. Try to contact people on LinkedIn, on other social networks in order to, to have a conversation about some professional issue. But it's, it's good to try to find people open to, to have those discussions and do not hesitate to do that because, because we have always been in a position that uh, we have needed this attention, this support from uh, people with more experience. So try to find the right people and try to, try to be nice with them because sometimes we also have to work and, uh, and we have very little time, but 
if you if we are confident about about this relation, um, it can construe, uh, it can build um, a very profitable relation for both parties. I think young practitioners have a lot to take away from your answer, um, just as a matter of conducting their practice. And even before stepping into the realm of being appointed as an arbitrator, there's so much to take away in just uh, practicing as a lawyer first. So that brings me to my next question. Um, you had mentioned earlier that, you know, with, even with all this hard work, being an arbitrator puts you in a very different position and a difficult one at that. So, um, Throwing back to your first appointment in 2014 as a domestic arbitrator, how would you describe your first appointment experience? I would, I would use one word, which is tense. I still remember the tension of being appointed as an arbitrator. I remember the tension um, of just answering the uh, independence and impartiality statement. Um, be careful that you don't forget anything. Be careful that you have done the, the you have conducted the research accurately. Uh, review review once and again the draft of the PO number one um, in order to have it perfect for the parties. Uh, prepare everything. Try to be responsive to the parties as uh, you know. Try to answer um, as soon as you can uh, to their emails, to their requests, to everything. So imagine when you are preparing the the the, the award, the project of the of the award, and try to have everything very well organized. And try not to forget anything, but not to overcharge the award with so many details that make people bored about you know reading it so it was it was a, a very tense experience but it was very fun i really really enjoyed it because i i had to study a lot more than i expected i can tell you that it was not prof profitable at all that first case that i spent so many hours i spent so much time doing my my work and doing my best for this uh, appointment that I totally forget. I totally forgot about anything else in, in, in my practice. So it was, it was a challenge and uh, I was very happy and I got more appointments from, from the institution. So I think I did it well. Thank you. Um, looking now at sort of your first international arbitral appointments arbitrator, what are some of the challenges you encounter when securing that one and was it in, was it an institutional appointment which I might assume yes yeah yeah well I had a very strong experience as a litigator in um, before starting with with arbitration so people may perceive that you are a newcomer in 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 the profession well I was I was old enough to not to be perceived as a, as a newcomer. But in any event, if they haven't seen you in, in other arbitration proceedings, um, they may think that you don't have that experience in the subject matter, for example, although you have gained that experience in uh, litigation. And I have also had international clients when I did litigation, and I had international companies that I was representing in court in Spain. So I had all the skills that a, a litigator has to need to have in uh, in the practice, but that was that was the, the probably the, the most uh, challenge. And this is probably what I what I would say to to answer this. So when I was young, first job ever, a partner told me. So when you are a young junior, new, starting out in a field, you don't know what you don't know. So it's very difficult for you to be responsible for anything at that point. So having said that, um, in your opinion, what are the benefits or advantages to parties when they decide you know, to give a young arbitrator a chance and to appoint a young arbitrator? Well, I remember the first, I, I remember the words of my 
co-arbitrators the first time I was appointed as chair in an arbitral tribunal. They say, we want you to work hard. That was, I, I will never forget that. They said that they were very open and they say, look, we want you because you're young. We know that you want to push, to push very hard. So we're appointing you, we're offering you to be the chair of, the, of this arbitral tribunal because we want you to work hard for this proceeding. And that was my reaction, of course. That's what I did. Well, I have to say that, you know, it's um, the, the appointment of a, of a young arbitrator. Uh, I'm very happy that the, the arbitral institutions are doing this in a regular basis. I think they, they need to give the opportunity to young people to jump in and to have their first experience in arbitration. Sometimes they try to find uh, apparently um, easy uh, proceedings in order to appoint young arbitrators. And that is a great idea. But there is another great idea, which is open the door to appoint secretaries to the tribunals because you can gain the experience without being in the front line. Once you have been there, once you, once you have been appointed as secretaries to the arbitral tribunals, and you have the insight of how the arbitral tribunal works, or even how the sole arbitrator work, works, it's a good moment to be appointed as arbitrator. And when you are appointed as arbitrator, um, the arbitral institutions have to be very wise to find the cases that first sight could be more comfortable for these new um, arbitrators. And, um, and the advantages is that, first of all, is, is availability of this uh, young arbitrator. It's supposed to have a better availability to take care of the development of the case. Sometimes these young arbitrators are working in big firms and that, could, that can be a disadvantage for them because we all know that they are overcharged with work and they have to make many hours um, due to the, to the um, obligations with the, with the firm. And that's it, I mean, they have to do it. But in any event, it's, also, it's always a good opportunity and they need to find the time to have this availability for the, for the case. The second point is that they will give everything for the case. They're going to do a very deep research for the case. Uh, they will be very focused on the details of the resolution of the case. So in my opinion, for uh, cases, for not complicated cases, it's excellent to appoint young arbitrators. How do you think senior arbitrators perceive having as president someone that's younger? Uh, what are the tribunal dynamics in that respect? And do you think they're receptive to it? Or does it depend on the person? Well, if the person is appointed by, by the co-arbitrators. If the chair of the, uh, is, is appointed by the co-arbitrators, I think they would be willing to, to have this person, of course. And I think what they will think is, is that, that I told you before, is uh, we, we have appointed you to do much of the work. We want you to, to be in charge of the proceeding, to give us as much as, as you can, in the in terms of the of the day to day of the of the proceeding, so uh, of course um, they would try to give their point of view about the the subject matter, about the proceeding, about everything. And if you are the chair, you need to learn about what they're telling you. You need to analyze 
uh, you need to be very professional with that. I mean, the dynamic of the of the arbitral tribunal should be exactly the same. Uh, every member of the arbitral tribunal giving their point of view about the case um, in the procedural part and the subject um, matter of the of the case. And uh, you need to take everything. You need to make a mix. You need to uh, have a look at it. Um, you don't need to split the baby. You need to take a decision and go ahead with it. Um, try to discuss. Try to learn in the in the discussions of the of the arbitral tribunal. And uh, but I don't think that would that would or should affect the dynamic of the of the arbitral tribunal. I know that someone sometimes um, young chairs are appointed in order to be influenced by one of the co-arbitrators, they think they, they may think that this person would be influenced by the autoritas of uh, one of the co-arbitrators. But I think that is, um, it's a matter of personality of the, of the chair or the young arbitrator to know that you are going to be examined, that you are going to be valued for your uh, decisions and for your performance as uh, as the chair of the arbitral tribunal, you, uh, your goal is not to be influenced in, in a bad way. I mean, by any of the of the co arbitrators, you need to have your your own opinion. You need to build your own opinion on the on the case based on your own experience, your own research, what the parties are telling you, and of course what the other co arbitrators are saying and make your mind up and put your decision on the table to be discussed with the other members of the arbitral tribunal. This is a very good question, Rocio. All right, Segimando. Um, thank you so much. It has been so great having your views um, shared with everyone today. I think all the viewers have a lot to take away from this session. Um, so we just have one final question for you um, before we wrap up today's interview session. Um, it is, so what are your thoughts on initiatives such as the AIAC's Diversity in Arbitration Week um, for promoting age diversity in international arbitration? Well, I think it's um, necessary. I think this and this initiatives are essential. It's a very good screen to the world. Uh, people need to know that we are thinking, or young practitioners need to know that we are thinking about them. They need to know that there's a door open in habitation, that if they do not hesitate, the opportunity will come. Of course, this is a pyramid. Not everybody starting at the bottom will get to the, to the top, but you can go, you can enjoy the steps that you're doing in this, uh, you're escalating this in this pyramid. But you, the young practitioners need to know that we are very aware that they are there, that we're looking for them, that we're trying to find the opportunity to give them the opportunity to jump in and to be um, involved in the habitation community, but also as arbitrator. One of the things that I also do is uh, sponsoring the FEA under 40 uh, international meeting. I always do that. I may not sponsor other conferences for senior um, arbitration events, but I try to do that with the young people because I want to show, you, show them that I am with them because I know it's very difficult to make a career in arbitration. And we need to show them that we are focused on them, that we have an eye on them, that we want to hear what they have to say. And this about uh, age diversity and sex diversity is very, very important. They need to be confident that we keep an eye on them, that as soon as we can, we will give them an opportunity to show themselves and to show their abilities to be arbitrators. So congratulations for this initiative. 
Thank you again. And um, it's been a delight, Rocio, um, to have you as a co-interviewer today and uh, the AIC is very thankful for both of your time and effort in setting time aside for this interview, preparing for it. And